Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to iMoot 16 Mini Moots. Uh, here with us, we have uh, Ravi talking about how to run a MOOC on Moodle. Ravi is a member of the Author Aid team. Uh, I hope you enjoy Ravi's presentation. Uh, so, if you're ready, Ravi, uh, take it away. Thank you very much for presenting for us. Okay. Thanks, Vinny. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm glad there are at least a few people, not just uh, talking to myself here. Uh, so I have uh, presented at, a, at a, the main iMode that was earlier this year. So I think there were uh, some more people then. Uh, but I, I'm glad to have the opportunity to uh, talk about this thing or topic, which is sort of really part of the most, you know, the current work that I'm doing, running some MOOCs on Moodle. Uh, so I'm, I'm in uh, Chennai, India. Uh, it's a hot place in South India. I think maybe the temperature is 30 degrees right now. Although, yeah, it's hotter over the summer. Uh, and there is some noise. There's some construction happening um, opposite across the street. And uh, you might hear some hammering now and then. But hopefully you can hear me OK through the rest of the talk. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I work, I don't really work so much in the Indian context, though. I, I'm a consultant for a nonprofit in the UK, um, which is called INASP, but uh, I work for the Authorate team. So that's, a, that's what I'm going to be talking about, the Authorate courses that I have uh, uh, set up and run. So Authorate is a project that supports developing country researchers in uh, communicating and publishing their work. Um, so most of the time I'm sitting here uh, at my uh, home office uh, and I'm doing something on Moodle and sometimes I travel, I, I've, uh, I travel to some of uh, uh, our partner countries in Africa and South Asia, uh, either for something related to Moodle or something related to more the research publishing. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's about me. Um, so I teach uh, scientific research writing, um, which is how to write research papers for publication in scholarly journals. So this is my uh, uh, this is what I teach. I do this both face to face and online. Although increasingly it is online, it's been mostly online for the past couple of years. Uh, about five years back, I set up the, um, uh, the Autoweek online course in research writing on, on, on our Moodle site. Uh, and we piloted it with, uh, with a group of just about 30 people. Uh, they were from uh, Rwanda. And most of them completed the course. So we thought, yeah, this, this could be a good approach. And we've, we've come quite a long way since then from the time when we were wondering if, if Moodle or an online course on Moodle would even be a feasible option. Now we are running uh, MOOCs. Um, so there was a big course that we did that was sort of, um, I think that was our uh, gateway to MOOCs a couple of years back. Um, the thing is there's huge demand for training on this topic because all over the world, researchers uh, who work at universities, um, they need to uh, not only do research, but they need to publish their research and they are evaluated based on their publications, their career, the grants they get, a lot of things depend on how, uh, on the number of publications, where they have published. So it is not an option. It's not just a nice to have thing to, to write papers for publication. For me, it is nice to do. I'm actually in the process of writing a paper, but I don't need to do it for my job. But for researchers, they've got to do it. Uh, so there is a lot of demand from developing countries. So all of these courses are we run out for developing country researchers. So even there, there is the same pressure to publish or perish that you have in um, in developed countries. Um, yeah. So we we uh, this course is um, uh, six weeks long, and we uh, uh, most people spend four to five hours per uh, per week on the course. And they're uh, adults. Uh, they work at universities, and they often uh, they 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 have uh, they at least have a bachelor's or master's, PhD. So this is um, what I teach. And just uh, now, in fact, right now there is another course going on. It's our third MOOC, which has about uh, I think um, there are about more than two thousand people who registered for for it. Uh, it's a little less than our our second MOOC. Um, yeah, so this, so I'm going to be talking about my experience largely uh, in this in this talk. It's just it's not a best practices as such, but more what has worked for me, what hasn't, and um, and hopefully that'll be of some use to you. Um, 
So first outcomes, just to let you know what has happened with these smokes before I go on to explain uh, what, uh, how we did it. So we thought maybe the, some of the, the interesting bit, I put it first. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, we run two MOOCs, both on the same topic, uh, which is research writing. Uh, the first MOOC, which, was, which happened about a year back, there were uh, about uh, 1,700 uh, uh, learners who registered, so just who entered the MOOC, who enrolled in the MOOC. Um, of which uh, about uh, 1,275 made a start. Now, uh, made a start, I'll, I'll come to that in a little bit. It's about uh, agreeing to the learning agreement and completing some things in the course induction section because the course was set up so that they could ac access the course material only after completing the, the, the material in the induction section. So I'll explain that in a bit, what, I, what this number means. So uh, of these, uh, about 600 completed the course there. So um, there were quizzes in the course. Again, I'm, I'll get to that in a bit. So the course completion criteria was mainly about passing the quizzes. Uh, um, and uh, we had 20 guest facilitators. So I think, I think that was really uh, the most uh, uh, interesting, perhaps most important aspect of the course, um, that there were uh, these facilitators who often responded uh, personally to, to the learners' questions. Uh, um, I think they, they made about a thousand posts by themselves and the learners made about 5,000 posts. So there was a, there was a fair bit of uh, attention for individual learners and definitely for the learners as a group. Um, so I think that's, that's really one of the uh, successful aspects of our course, of, of the model that we have. So that was the first MOOC which happened a year back. And then the second MOOC, which, uh, which took place um, about six months back, now there were more uh, people who registered this time, uh, 3,000, um, and 1,500 made a start. So this time we saw sort of a greater dropout right at the beginning, nearly 50% of those who had registered uh, for the course did not even start, did not even uh, you know, complete the learning agreement. Um, uh, and But then from that base, uh, 900 completed the course. So in terms of completion rate, so I always like to present all of these numbers, how many completed the course, how many made a start, and how many were actually registered. Because there's often a big dropout in any MOOC. I think there's a huge dropout uh, right at the beginning. Uh, and I, I don't know, but I think it's, uh, I've not done a lot of research into why that is, but I guess it's just so easy to sign up. Maybe there's momentary interest that some people have and it, that interest fades away and they don't actually want to take the course when it begins. Uh, yeah, so that, that's one reason. So I think as, as someone uh, who uh, facilitates a MOOC, um, I, I, yeah, I'm interested in presenting all the numbers and if you are also, I think you should be too, because in a way it's, it's um, you can look at the, you know, what is a completion rate? It is 902 out of 1555, which is, which is good, which is 60%, or is it 900 out of 3000? Uh, that would be much lower. Um, again, we had a lot of guest facilitators. Uh, so what we have found is uh, many of our guest facilitators want to, uh, are facilitating course again and again. They're really interested. They like this, this, this uh, job of facilitating. They're not paid, it's a voluntary uh, task. And well, we, uh, the thing is we, we managed to get all these people on the course because AuthorAid is, is not just about the online courses are sort of new at AuthorAid. We've been a network for, for many years. There are about 10,000 people who are members on the website. So we have a fairly large audience uh, who, are, who have an interest in AuthorAid and who know of us as a nonprofit project. They don't expect to get paid. Um, yeah, so I think we are we are in a somewhat uh, you know special position because of that. Um, yeah, so again, the guest facilitators did a uh, remarkable job. Um, and uh, another thing that we have found is in our MOOCs, it's not just uh, forums that are just chaotic and and learners are just you know posting questions or comments or or or, or freaking out uh, about what they've got to do. Now, the, the, the forum, because of the guest facilitators, and also I am there on the MOOC as a sort of overall facilitator. I have a colleague who is an administrator. And we've set up different forums, which I'll get to in, in a bit. Uh, so there's even something called a research networking forum, because researchers often need to collaborate or, or have an interest in even international collaboration. So uh, there is a lot of uh, chatter happening on the research networking forum. And uh, the way uh, we just use the standard Moodle sort of privacy, uh, privacy permissions, 
So users can set their email address to be visible. Um, their profiles are generally visible. So in some of, in some of the MOOCs I took a couple of years back, uh, it was really the learners were really, you know, just names or not even names. They were just nicknames. You know, there was no such thing as viewing someone else's profile. But Moodle is more, uh, I think, social, and we and I think that works. So people are, uh, our participants are getting in touch with each other and uh, they plan to remain in touch. So uh, which I think is a, is a really nice outcome. It's not just a group of completely anonymous people who just enter and leave the course without knowing anything about anyone else. Um, so this is what uh, has happened in the MOOCs uh, that I've been involved in. Um, now uh, I'll get to more about uh, the course. Before that, the Moodle setup. Now this is just one slide. I am not the, so the technical guy as such um, where I work. Um, so what we have is, uh, is we, we've hosted our Moodle on, on Linode, uh, the 8 GB plan. I think I'm fairly sure that's, that's, uh, that's correct. Uh, I've got these details right. Um, it is off the shelf Moodle. Um, it's, there are no customizations. We've done no development whatsoever. And I've hardly even used many plugins beyond the certificate and a few other plugins. So there's a lot I know that that I can do uh, before we get into you know anything like development. Um, and I'm a front-end site admin. I don't do the maintenance. So I wouldn't uh, be able to uh, uh, you know, um, tell you what you know what exactly did we do to at the back end to get the core site set up. Although I don't think our IT company did much because I'm hardly in touch with them. They just do, I, I think it's just some basic maintenance that they handle. Um, it's more the front end activities that we focus on. Um, um, yeah, so we were on Moodle 2.6. We just recently upgraded to 3.1. Uh, and Scott's presentation was really useful just now to understand a little more about uh, the competency frameworks. I've still not, I think that's, that would be a really useful addition to, uh, to our MOOCs. Um, um, yeah, so this is the setup. Um, and this is uh, just a screenshot of the homepage of our site, just the, the clean theme. Um, so we uh, we try to keep our site as uh, light or as light as possible because most of our learners are come from developing countries where there are often issues with uh, bandwidth uh, connectivity. Uh, so uh, the clean theme works. Uh, and then even in the course, there are not many graphical elements. We use very few videos. It's largely text-based, but uh, I think quite interactive nevertheless. Um, yeah, so that's also something that we learned long back. In fact, that was really the make or break thing with our with, with the pilot course and with the initial courses we ran in Moodle to see whether this whole approach works for a developing country context, because often um, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's talk about uh, internet connectivity, bandwidth, and but generally our, our course approach seems to work, that it's, it's text-based but interactive. It's not just PDF, so just static content, uh, there are a lot of activities. Uh, Moodle has so many activities, you know. Um, yeah, so uh, that was, that's about the, the site. Um, now, so oh, I guess I, uh, you, know, you might, uh, you're here because I guess you're interested in this, in this topic, but uh, um, yeah, I, I, I've really run a MOOC on only one topic, which is research writing. And I also happen to be the teacher of that topic. So I'm in a very, you know, kind of a niche area. I wouldn't call myself a MOOC expert, but I, I think I know what has worked for the, what I teach um, and what can be improved. So it's really going to be drawing on that experience. And I leave you to pick and choose whatever is relevant to you. Um, so what's a MOOC? Uh, that's the first thing. It's, it's quite a buzzword. Uh, I, I even come across people who call any online course a MOOC. When I say online course, they 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 say MOOC. Well, and then well, so it, it's 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 come to that, I guess. Uh, so people want to run MOOC some of them without thinking about just online pedagogy or. So what is it? Is it hundred thousand? So I think the number doesn't matter so much. Uh, is it? Is it? Uh, I'm not really. You know, I think. OOC would be better, open online course, but it doesn't sound very good. Uh, so what is massive? Is this a quite a, you know, quite an adjective that doesn't uh, you know, really mean much? Um, so I don't, I don't have an answer. Um, so but I think a thousand person course is really kind of a big course. Uh, so it could be called a MOOC. Um, 
and then uh so um yeah so then the thing is 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 uh does your organization or your institution or even yourself if you're an individual teacher so does do you have a brand to attract a huge number of learners and when i think of mooc i think for me it is it is really quite a uh, you know there's a broad geographical reach um if it's just uh if it's if it's uh, and it's because it's got to be open um uh, what if it's an open course at only at, at an institutional level it is to is it still open i don't know maybe it's it's kind of in a gray area uh but for me a mooc is kind of open to a wide uh, geography whether a region or a nation or the world um so it's about uh, whether there are enough people in the world to uh, who your organization that can organization can attract um and is there enough demand on the topic and i think this is really important uh, i know for research writing there is a huge demand because researchers are often even desperate to publish they want to they want to get trained in how to write and publish and this is a training they often don't receive um where they where they work uh, yeah so whereas courses on niche topics uh, even if you you know if they could uh, theoretically be moocs but maybe there isn't enough demand for it to be a mooc um then uh what about your learners would they like being part of a smaller course and so being in a mooc and what can be done to to uh, you know address the negative aspects why a mooc approach i i think uh it's it's easy uh, i think i have also been there that that there's this sort of craze around moocs uh and a lot of online course providers or universities also i think there is this uh, some pressure to get into moocs um uh, because it's the next big thing or it's already a big thing um but what is a pedagogical reasoning uh, i've not used the word pedagogy so much or at all in this in these slides i try to try to stay away from that but generally what is the reasoning for a mooc approach uh beyond uh, the yeah kind of the fact that it's it's a it's it's a buzzword or you know if uh, yeah um and what would your learners gain i think there are things to gain for learners by being part of a mooc if the mooc is designed to 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 help them gain something beyond uh, well knowledge or just checking understanding i think for uh, for the course i teach what we have found that the networking aspect is really is something they gain they gain more from being part of a larger group of uh, people and they can even correspond with them privately if uh, they've just you know if they Uh, let their email addresses be known if they're active on the research networking forum so there is there is something to gain for them there are more connections that they could make which could uh really help them with their research uh by being part of this big course so i think that's that's uh, uh, that's one thing they would gain which they wouldn't in a smaller course um and then some more questions what have you offered the course before to a smaller audience and what can be reused from that course what cannot be reused uh because they wouldn't lend themselves to a larger course uh what are the new or what are the new opportunities or for new activities and some uh, are there similar moocs how's your moc going to be different so uh i know there is a course that is offered quite irregularly by course era on um on scientific writing uh, i've even uh, looked at the course i think it i think it's been offered twice in the past 3 or 4 years uh and i don't know when it's going to be offered again i think it's a really good course uh it's different from the course we have but it's broadly on the same topic um so i sometimes wonder what if uh, you know and that course is is uh, has a stanford brand so i wonder what if that course or a course like that or many courses like that are offered by edx and coursera regularly would there be reduced demand for the authorate course there could be uh so uh, i like to keep an eye on that uh and to see that what we offer is something uh somewhat unique um you know in a way it is unique because it is it caters to developing country researchers you know the content is geared towards developing country researchers um and uh i think this uh you know evaluating success being open about what happened i i think that is something i would say it's missing perhaps with the larger mooc providers there's sort of something opaque happening which is fine you know they have their own uh you know ways of working so what we do is we we write about every course you can read a report of both our mooks on our on the authorate blog uh, if you want to know more um and also about offering it again uh because i think it's it's uh, it's fair to the sort of learner audience if 
if they know when the course is going to be offered again or if it will not be offered again. Uh, otherwise, there is, you know, it, it's kind of unpredictable. So I think these are a couple of elements that you can use to distinguish uh, your MOOC uh, so that it's not like, you know, it's something the strategy is really behind closed doors and, uh, you know, people won't know when, when or if it will be offered again. Um, I think openness is good in a massive open online course. I think even the 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 strategy and and the future of of this course should also be more open in of any MOOC. Um, so let's say you you want to run a MOOC, then what? Um, um, so uh, here I'm getting into the implementation uh, of the MOOC again. What I have done in Moodle. Um, and seems to work for the most part, and I, uh, and I would like to make some improvements, um, especially now that we are on Moodle 3.1. Uh, so this is what I've done. Uh, I, I've taken some courses, some courses on um, uh, Moodle, uh, just Moodle training itself, which the course is spread over actually multiple Moodle courses. Uh, I know that's a way of, of, of approaching a larger topic um, and to put a set of courses within a category and have learners enroll in them. Uh, I don't do that. It's just within one Moodle course, so there's only one enrollment stage, uh, uh, yeah. And there's one section per page, um, so that there's no kind of scroll of death, uh, a really long course page. Uh, there's a course induction section, and right after that, there are a, a section with just discussion forums. Um, all the discussion forums are in their own section, so it's easy to see uh, unread posts in any forum, to dip in and out of different forums. Um, I think this works. Um, I'll get to the course induction section very soon. Uh, there are uh, five course topics on different aspects of writing a paper uh, or in preparing to write a paper, uh, such as you know, literature review, research ethics, uh, uh, elements of a research paper, publishing a paper in a journal. So these are the course topics. After that, there's a wrap-up section. Um, uh, with uh, feedback form, certificate download. Uh, I use a topics format, uh, but the course actually flows weekly with one topic per week. I don't use a weekly format because uh, the first two sections are not part of the weekly uh, routine. They are, you know, the induction and discussion forums. So that's the main reason I use the topics format to manually move it from week to week. Uh, yeah, this is a, really an overview of the course layout that I use. Uh, anytime you have you have questions, just uh, you know, uh, pop a message on the chat window. Um, yeah. So um, groups. Um, yeah. So what about groups? I I uh, I I've, I've experimented with groups in a smaller course, which had about two hundred and fifty people. Uh, now I've realized that for the kind of course I teach, it's better to have all the learners in one group, but have discussion forums on separate topics. Um, because uh, uh, that way there is more, uh, because it's about writing a research paper and uh, there are many perspectives, many questions, and many responses that come in. And by splitting people into groups, it's, it's kind of unproductive when there are, then there's a lot of uh, excellent discussions happening in one group and learners in another group might also find those useful. They are either left out completely or can only read what's happening. Um, yeah. So, I think this works better, but uh, I use groups for putting the course facilitators or our guest facilitators, um, and then I, I give them a logo, um, and the logo appears when they make a post. So it's very easy to see who is a facilitator, and, and because there are more than a thousand learners and twenty or so guest facilitators, so when all the guest facilitators posts can be uh, are visually marked with this logo in the in the forum discussions. Uh, so that's the main reason I use uh, the group for the course facilitators, but but the forums are set as uh, as no group, so it's not like the facilitators are in their own group. So the forums don't actually have a group, but just the logo appears when the facilitators make a uh, make a post. Um, yeah. So uh, course induction, which I think is a really important aspect of of a MOOC, uh, or at least a MOOC that is. Um, I, I think uh, a lot of MOOCs, uh, at least once I've seen the you know, the course era. So it's more like uh, it's 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 really um, easy in a way to get started. You sign up and immediately you're in the course. You can access often everything in the course. You can look at any video. You can take any quiz. It's it's really comp open. Uh, yeah, and that has its. Uh, that has its advantages in that it's it's more it's just you can, as a learner you just plunge in and then you you figure out what you want to learn whether you want to go in a sequence or 
uh, and it can be more excited that way. Uh, but um, in the context in which I work, uh, there learners often have little or no experience with, with e-learning. Uh, they are uh, adult learners in developing countries we reach. They're often new to e-learning or often they have not taken a course like this, somewhat interactive online course. And uh, they uh, have questions about the navigation. Uh, it just creates more confusion if, if it's just opened up, everything is opened up like that. Uh, and then, well, what, what happens after that? So then there are, there are a lot of questions about how to do this, how to do that, because we've not read some of the basic things about the course, the deadlines, uh, how it works, what is the completion criteria. So, and that leads to more work for the facilitator, or you can just ignore those questions. Now, I don't like uh, either option. I don't want to just let the learners fend for themselves. That is not our approach to have the learners completely you know, uh, um, you know, leave them high and dry, so to speak, that sort of, uh, you know, survival of the fittest. It's not what we uh, want to do. We do want to provide as much support as is, uh, as is practically possible. So, uh, so one way we do that is by perhaps, so this makes a course perhaps a little, you know, a kind of a uh, slightly dull start to the course, but it has, but, but everyone is on the same page. Um, so what is it? There is an introduction resource in the, in the course induction section. There's even a survey. Uh, I like the ATTLS survey. Uh, so every time I run the survey, I find that most learners, at least you know, that I work with, they prefer connected learning. So that 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 uh, bit is higher than separate learning. Uh, and this is useful. And they can also see the, the result. They can also see the same graph. And it's useful to kind of get them to think about connected learning and to encourage interaction. Uh, then there is the background information form pre-course quiz these are more things that we do just for our purposes it's not um, I, yeah it's, it's really more for internal reasons um, but learning agreement I think is helpful uh, we mentioned some things here about uh, uh, how to be uh, really how to kind of prepare for the course um, so that they and then they have got to mark learners have got to mark their acceptance by just checking the option called yes I agree and then they can access the course material. So the, so the course material, uh, every topic is conditional access. Um, so this might seem a bit uh, well, bureaucratic or, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, but I think uh, it just reduces, it doesn't, it doesn't do away with the questions. Still, uh, there are questions about uh, deadlines. Uh, that's the most common kind of question. Course completion criteria, although these are mentioned in the learning agreement. Uh, and in the in, in other places in the induction, but um, yeah, learners still ask questions. But I think we we reduce kind of the the the, uh, the scale of the questions. They might, when you know, otherwise maybe a hundred learners would be asking these questions, and because of this learning agreement, maybe twenty do, and that's more manageable. So we still answer those questions. We don't leave them hanging because we can answer that uh, limited number of technical queries. Um, I think this works, uh, and then we also get to know as a result how many people actually made a start on the course. So for us, only those who have completed the material in the induction section, they are the course starters. So there's a clear number. We can look at any of these things. We can look at the feedback or the background information on the pre-course or the learning agreement. So we know how many have actually done this bit. Uh, so those are the course starters. Um, so yeah, that's that's how the course begins. Uh, it's kind of mandatory to, to yeah, agree to the learning agreement. Um, and then the forums. Uh, so we have all the forums in one place. In the main forums, there's one for each topic to get the discussions focused. There is a forum uh, for specifically for discussing research ethics and forum for uh, publishing a paper in a journal. Still, there are learners who, who, who make posts in, in, the, in the incorrect forum. Uh, and sometimes we move those uh, to facilitators can move the discussions. Um, yeah, that's quite easy to do in Moodle. Uh, and then there are other forums, introductions, networking, social forum. Um, so we use labels to split the two categories of forums. It seems to work. It's really nice to see just in one place all the forums, the unread posts, um, quickly dependent out of any forum, uh, as opposed to putting the forums within the, the course topics. Uh, I prefer this approach. Um, Uh, so within a course topic, uh, I won't go into this in detail because it's really specific to the, you know, the course that I teach, uh, but there's basically uh, uh, content and a quiz. Now I know it's, it's not 
it's not very exciting and I want to do something about this. So what else can, can be included? Something uh, to think about. So at the moment there is content in the, so we, I, I, I've used this uh, on open source tool uh, called EXE Learning. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's open source. You can, it's free to download. It's now the reason was a kind of an organizational reason um, uh, that we wanted to provide the content and also a downloadable format. And even it's not just downloadable, but also standalone format uh, outside of the course context. That's the reason why I, I'm not, um, um, uh, yeah, so it's not like I'm, I'm very partial towards EXC learning. Um, we are thinking of recreating the content using Moodle book or, or uh, I, I in, in an earlier version, I used Moodle lesson, but uh, the lesson tool is, is kind of, yeah, it's kind of uh, intricate. Uh, and I, w I might not use that one, but uh, it's just something we are exploring at the moment. Yeah, there's e EXC learning and there's a check your understanding quiz in every topic. Um, there is a passing score. Now, I, I thought this was really a very elementary way of doing assessment, but I realized, good looking at how many attempts most of the learners make to pass the quiz, that it's actually, and, and going by the feedback that also the, we get from learners, that it's most people feel that it's at the right level of difficulty. Although I would have thought it's kind of easy because it only covers the material covered in the content. Um, yeah, but I think it, it is working, uh, um, and there's a passing score. Um, and this is this is part of the course completion criteria. The learners uh, must pass all the all these quizzes to to get a course completion certificate. Um, so uh, if you use the quiz tool in Moodle, you know that it's it's really uh, an amazing um, uh, tool for. There are so many options you can use um, for setting up quizzes, uh, and I use quite a few of those. But I know there's a lot that I haven't used yet. Um, so the quiz is one of the central aspects of the course. Um, and peer assessment, also another uh, uh, really important part of the course. Now the course is about research writing. So do people do any writing? Uh, yeah, they do. There are two writing activities in the course, one of which is a research abstract writing activity. And for this, I use Moodle Workshop. Um, uh, and it works well. It's uh, it's definitely takes a bit of work to set up. Uh, it did the first time and to improve it, uh, give the right instructions for the submission and assessment phase. Uh, I think it works well. Feedback is good from the participants. And I even gave a talk about this last year. Um, but still, no matter, you know, there's something that like, we keep trying to improve the way we provide instructions and, and set up the activities. But a lot of learners have questions because I think it, the whole concept is really new to them. Uh, uh, maybe peer assessment in general um, and then peer assessment online and then the deadlines. So there is this, uh, most of the questions we get on the technical queries forum have to do with something to do with the peer assessment activities, how to upload something how to check whether they've got, whether it's been uploaded, the deadlines, the submission or the assessment phase. It's um, it, it just, uh, every time, it's, this is like a major, uh, uh, this is the biggest area of confusion. Um, but it is working well on the whole and it's really important uh, because there is no way we can do this outside of peer assessment. We cannot set up an assignment tool and have the facilitators correct the writing because there are, there are more than a thousand participants. Uh, if any feedback on writing has to be given in a MOOC, I think it's got to be done through uh, peer assessment. Uh, there isn't uh, really, it can't, you know, it can't be the facilitators or teachers who, who do it. Uh, it's not feasible. So it's, uh, I think it's an important aspect of the course, but something we've got to keep improving. Um, and yeah, um, yeah so a technical, there, are, there is technical support available. Um, and as I mentioned, most questions are related to the peer assessment activities. And near the end of the course, learners get anxious about when will I get the certificate? Although we mentioned all this in a, even in the announcement for that week, but still, uh, yeah, people, uh, no matter um, how much you write, how many instructions, uh, there are learners who don't read uh, those instructions. So there are questions. But I think at this point, that's still manageable. There is one, my colleague who is uh, administrator of the course, he does most of the, he, he handles all these uh, questions. And uh, I think he's, he's able to manage. It's not like we get thousands of questions. We get a manageable number and we can respond to them individually. So I think this is a reason 
I wouldn't want to uh, say that our course completion rate is really high, but I think it's it's uh, it's good uh, if it's sixty percent of this course starters. And I think it's partly because we do provide some support to learners who are uh, who are who are confused, who have even you know simple questions. Uh, we don't we try to uh, you know address those questions. Um, yeah, so this is a technical support bit. So that's really what my experience uh, and stepping back a little bit uh, to consider which Moodle activities. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the content because I'm not a huge fan of content. There is just a lot of content online by there. And with Moodle, you can use the book. I mean, you can use even upload a PDF. I'm, I think it's really an online course is about the activities. And Moodle has uh, you know, 14 types of activities that come out of the box. Uh, and there are more plugins, uh, so uh, so for me, it's really uh, which of those are good for a MOOC. Uh, how can I use them in, in new ways? Uh, yeah. So, uh, well, all of them, all of the activities. Um, I don't know. So uh, I've used these. I've used forum, quiz, workshop, choice, feedback, survey, certificate. It's kind of uh, that we call the activity. Uh, uh, so that's a plugin. So um, yeah, I think the quiz and the workshop are the central activities in the course and forum as well. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, there is a choice activity, which is mainly the learning agreement, but it's also uh, I've used it in some other course to get uh, to kind of do a poll now and then. Um, yeah, so I know these are working uh, for the course I teach. Uh, I, I, I also use a glossary, but I don't use it as an activity, but it's more to provide tips, context uh, specific tips as pop-ups here and there uh, in the course. Uh, so it's not an activity for the learners, but uh, you can make, you know, it, it can be a learner. Uh, it can involve learners in building a glossary in building a wiki in a database. These could work well. Um, I have not done those yet. I've used them in the con in some other courses, but not in this course so far. And the thing is, in a MOOC, when you put in an activity, I think there there has to be a bit of a strategy. If it's not working well, it's going to be obvious it's not working well uh, because of very few learner contributions. Or if it's chaotic, or if it causes a lot of confusion, it might distract from the main uh, from the key activities in the course. If learners are getting distracted or worried about this kind of minor activity, so. It's 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 uh, it's uh, uh, it's got to, you know, I've got to be a little careful in introducing a new activity. I've got to kind of uh, make sure it's going to work fine or test it out in a smaller course. And yeah, what might not work well? I think uh, assignment because uh, I I think with assignment even perhaps it changes some permissions. You can have learners grade each other's work perhaps, but uh, I'm not I've not gone there. But typically, an assignment is just a uh, learner submit something for the teacher to evaluate. I don't think this would work very well in a MOOC because uh, if you're talking about 1,000 learners and a few teachers, um, it's going to be hard to for teachers to look at individual assignments. Chat. Now, I've, I've not even used chat even in a smaller course. The one time I tested it out, it, I don't think it worked very well. There were some delays. and. Uh, and again, for, for e first-time e-learners um, and those with English as a second language, uh, I think the chat might not be a very good uh, you know, option. And for a MOOC, it might become yeah, uh, quite chaotic. Or, yeah. So I, I, my feeling is these might not work well, but I, uh, I'm happy to hear of good examples when you, uh, of, uh, if these have worked well in the context of a MOOC on Moodle. So, and I'm not going into plugins yet. There's just a lot of plugins um, uh, for activities. So, um, yeah, I'm sure there are more that you can use um, for a MOOC. Um, enrollment. Um, how did I deal with enrollment? Um, so, I've. Um, um, yeah, dot us with the progress bar. Um, yeah, I've, I've not. Um, yeah, so I, I, I guess, uh, is it the um, activity, uh, sort of the, the completion, uh, course completion status, if that's, is, are you asking about that block or the or the progress? I've seen the progress bar in, in the Moodle lesson. If it's a course completion status block or uh, a thing is, uh, I don't use that because there are two sets of, um, Okay, activity, activity completion. 
Um, yeah, so I, I've, I like to keep the, um, the kind of the, um, the course layout, the course page uh, as minimal as possible. I use a search forums that's there. Online users block, that's really nice because in a MOOC, at any point there are you know, uh, 40 or 50 or more online learners. Um, I don't know, the, I also use the upcoming events. Upcoming events is there, so any deadline that's right there. But in spite of that, I think because there, is, um, there are uh, more than a thousand learners, uh, there are often are always some who don't look at that. I also mentioned something about time zone, how to edit the time zone, so it's all there. And the only way to, I think it's by giving more instructions, and I don't want to keep giving more and more and more instructions, uh, but I know there are some things that can be tweaked to perhaps improve the you know, how learners register deadlines. But yeah, I think it's just the MOOC. One has to be prepared for getting and you know all these technical questions or, or anxious learners. It's it is going to happen. And the question is, no matter how well you provide instructions, how well designed the course the user interface is, and especially if you deal with first time e learners. Um, uh, yeah, so the question is, are you going to respond to those questions or not? You can ignore them as well. You can tell people in advance that, hey, there's no technical support. We have provided all the instructions. You've got to read them, and that's it. So that's fine. That's one way to run a MOOC. But if you want to uh, provide some more attention, then you've got to build in for answering these questions. Um, so yeah, I, I've used email-based self-registration uh, because our Moodle site is open to everyone. Anyone can create an account. Uh, and uh, we don't have it connected to any other you know, system as such, so we don't use other authentic authentication methods. I've used self-enrollment with an enrollment key and even without, and both work. Uh, um, yeah, I agree, Trish. Uh, and then, yeah, a person will be uh, hugely in demand, I think. Everyone will want to write instructions. Uh, uh, because instructions from one course to another and, and for peer assessment activities, we have really specific instructions. Yeah, so. Is this an iterative process to approach some kind of you know, uh, yeah, uh, efficiency, I guess. Um, so self-enrollment is what we've done with and without enrollment key. Um, uh, and enrollment limit. So this is really useful in Moodle. So because we, are, uh, we don't want to have 10,000 learners. So I think for us, 3,000 to 4,000 is all right. It's manageable. And we usually set it at 3,000 or one of those two numbers. And it's usually under that just so that we are not swamped, just so we don't find ourselves one day that there are 10,000 people who have registered. Um, so it's useful to set a limit, even though it's a MOOC, uh, you can have a bit of a limit. Um, uh, I don't know about bulk user upload. Um, I've done this for other kinds of courses, but I don't think it's a, it's a MOOC approach. A MOOC for me means that uh, a learner should just be able to get an account on the site and just enroll in the course by themselves uh, and not be enrolled by someone else um yeah so and there yeah so this is just a quick overview of the enrollment that i've used um what about facilitation uh as i mentioned for us the guest facilitators facilitation is a central aspect of, of the course i think uh one way to run a mooc is just about a huge number of learners talking about themselves or doing whatever on the forums and uh and then there is some teacher on videos sometimes on the forums uh, learners are largely fend for themselves um, and they've got to go through the course, that's it. Um, yeah, so uh, that's one way to run a MOOC, but uh, that's not the only way. I think even if it's a MOOC, there can be more of a teacher presence. For us, the guest facilitation model has worked well. We provide certificates, badges, and, I've, and I know of at least one guest facilitator who has who has mentioned, you know, who has mentioned, has put this uh, badge on his online profile, and he's actually uh, quite a highly accomplished researcher. And he has mentioned that he's, he's got a badge for this course. So it it is it is an incentive, I think. Um, I think, yeah, it's about forum presence. It's not about putting content or videos. Uh, and I think it's really about having more facilitators doing something on the forums. Uh, facilitation guidelines we have. Uh, we provide facilitation guidelines. We ask them to agree to those guidelines before they get on the course. Uh, so, in fact, much of my work, I'm, I'm called the course facilitator, but actually, I'm hardly on the course these days. I'm working behind the scenes with the guest facilitators. I'm looking at 
how well they are doing. I've, uh, uh, I'm in touch with them. So that has become my work as a course facilitator and really behind the scenes now. Um, yeah, so I think teacher presence is really uh, important uh, in an online course, whether a MOOC or a non-MOOC. Uh, I think just because it's a MOOC, uh, just to give content and quizzes and activities and just make it completely self-study, is really the easy way out, I would say. And it's not, doesn't, might not make for an exciting uh, or engaging course experience. Um, it's about human facilitators or teachers. Um, so at least that's, I strongly believe in that. Um, reports, learning analytics, uh, yeah, Moodle has a lot of, uh, provides a lot of ways to get data out. I use a great book a lot because uh, for me, the course completion criteria, I mainly need to look at whether they've passed the quizzes and whether they've got uh, um, uh, uh, the grades for the submission and assessment phases of the peer assessment activities. Um, I use logs to count forum posts and to uh, maybe some other things to count. Uh, yeah, and then I combine the background information form and gradebook to make one big spreadsheet. And with this, I can look at, um, I can do some uh, uh, statistical analysis to look at associations between different things. Um, so this is just something I've started doing lately. I'm not uh, I'm picking up some statistics as I go along. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's really nice. You can, I think uh, you can get to the point of doing uh, some you know intricate analysis and figuring out associations. For example, we have found that there is uh, there is a link between gender and course completion. Our uh, female course participants are more likely to complete the course. The percentage difference is not huge, but just because of the big population or the big number of participants, that is uh, that difference is statistically significant. Um, so I think with the MOOC, there is a lot of there is a lot of opportunity for uh, statistical analysis because uh, there is a, a big uh, uh, the, the numbers are big and yeah so that's that's good I think for statistics in general um, yeah so uh, that's what I've done uh, I think it really helps to have some Excel skills uh, uh, intermediate to advanced skills so uh, if if you don't have that yourself you can you know, I, I would strongly recommend you you get someone a colleague to help you analyze the course data because there's a lot of useful uh, data uh, that you can get from a MOOC and you can analyze that and use that to refine your own approach of how to offer the MOOC again. Um, so yeah, that's uh, pretty much reached the end of, of this uh, talk. So it's time you could start thinking about any questions you have. Um, so closing thoughts. Um, I think Moodle is a great platform to run a MOOC. Uh, uh, it gives you great power and flexibility, but with that also comes uh, great responsibility. Uh, it's easy to make a Moodle course uh, ugly <laughs> or or just not work or just make it really confusing for learners and just make it a bad example of, a, of, a, of an online course. That's unfortunately very easy to do, I think, in Moodle, um, but because there is so much flexibility. Uh, but of course, the reverse is also true. It's, it's possible to make a course so targeted and so uh, right for the learner audience that it just works. Um, yeah, so um, I think I like to keep the course layout simple. I even use a two column layout. I don't use a three column layout because I know that most of the learners I work with, they are on laptops and so am I. I don't even use a, a full screen, you know, like a big monitor uh, because uh, generally I like to be, you know, replicate the learner experience. So uh, for a small, you know, screen, uh, I tend to think that the two column layout works. There are very few blocks. As online users, is one of my favorites because in a MOOC, it really gives us a sense of how many people are logged in or are learning at the same time as, as you are. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, and I would say, yeah, if, if, if you're just key, uh, if you've um, not running for the same course for a small audience, I would encourage you to do that first um, before scaling it up as a MOOC. And I think forum and quiz uh, are really good to include in any MOOC on Moodle because with the quiz there is some there is some assessment you can you can build in without uh, that that is automated and the forum is 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 just great for connected learning for um, yeah it's the life of the course I would say uh, and of course there's just so many other activities uh, yeah, that that you can use um, yep so that's that's all I had to say uh, about how to run a MOOC on Moodle. 
Um, if you have any questions, um, uh, I would be happy to hear from you over email. Um, and you can check out Authraid, uh, the website. If you just search for it online, and you can even search for Authraid MOOC, uh, you will see a couple of blog posts or more than that about what we have done. Um, so yeah, that's. Uh, so I hope this was useful. Uh, I hope this has given you some ideas for your own MOOC approach. Um, yeah. So we have a few minutes left. I will just hang around if there are any questions. Hi, Ravi. This is Vinny from the iMOOC team. Just jumping in to thank you once more for presenting. And uh, I hope you and everybody else enjoy the rest of the sessions today. Thanks, Vinny. Thanks, Ken. Trish. Dot.